Hi, and welcome to Meet Our Ex Success Stories, and I'm Brooke. And today I have, um, I'm going to be talking to Robin from Down Under. Hi, Robin, how are you? Hi, Brooke, I'm well. Thank you for being available and thank you for doing that with me. Nice to meet you, and, and, not, and thank you for taking the time to share with our listeners what your carnivore journey has been. Yeah, no problem. So let's get started. How has it been? What brought you to the carnivore diet? Yeah, um, so a lot of people find it uh, because they're trying to attack a particular health issue or uh, something else. Um, I previously was not suffering from obesity or I didn't have any other chronic health conditions that I was aware of. I really prided myself in um, my nutrition and my diet and my health. I work as a practitioner. I'm trained as a chiropractor. And I just was really under the impression I had it figured out, you know, I got the education and all the research and I know what the right thing to do is with activity and exercise and, and diet. And if you want to save the planet and do something good for yourself, then, you know, you have to be at least whole food based, even better plant based or even vegetarian or vegan or something like that. And um, I followed that. It was very low fat, no sugar, no salt, no oil, very, very little meat and predominantly whole food, vegetable based, not due to ideological reasons other than believing that that's the way for longevity and for good health. So it was grains and beans, whole foods, plants? Uh, yeah, so um, it's, it's mainly uh, green vegetables, leafy vegetables, uh, doing lots of stir fries. Uh, I was born in Germany, so we eat a lot of bread and I had a lot of bread. I had overnight oats and other things as well. I did occasionally eat pasta and other things, but, um, you know, pumpkin, chickpeas, kale, spinach, green beans, uh, bell peppers, that kind of stuff. And uh, I was under the impression I was, it would, yeah, it was working very well for me. I know it well. I know it well. Yeah. And so um, since things are going well for you and you had your diet sort of, um, honed in what then made you think of switching it up yeah i became very curious about it because uh the the whole carnivore diet thing people being on an all meat diet was uh becoming a little bit more popular and there were a couple of appearances on joe rogan as well and i thought oh my god now i'm gonna have a lot of patients asking questions about this but what really flicked the switch for me was because i'm interested in idiopathic conditions and especially autoimmune disease as well i saw some credible uh, sources from that community that autoimmune disease can be addressed or even completely reversed by changing diet and by eliminating plant foods and by going on an animal-based diet or even completely meat-based diet and the, the petersons michaela and jordan peterson being prominent figures in that as well and those were people that i had heard of from different contexts and they seemed to have good credibility and uh, i just became very curious and wanted to find out is there actually something to it and before i uh, subject uh, people to something i'd like to try it out myself and then last year at the beginning of last year maybe february or march um i just decided okay i'm gonna give this a go i'm gonna do it for a month you know what's the worst thing that can happen i'm gonna hate it and then i can go back to do my thing and that would be the uh, the end of it all so i transitioned slowly and uh, methodically i just replaced one meal a day previously i was eating at least three times at that time. I had snacks in between as well to, to keep me going. I was already training maybe 10 hours a week. Um, I uh, was, was very active as well. And uh, I yeah just started replacing uh, one meal a day with, at the beginning was steak. And I had never really cooked steak before. I was, you know, horribly well done and, and <laughs> uh, dense and dry and, and all that and very chewy. But um, I uh, just found that... Um, quite immediately my digestion improved, even though I was not under the impression that I had digestive issues. With all the fiber that I was eating, um, you know, I had very regular trips to the bathroom and it was not necessarily particularly uncomfortable, but um, I just had no idea what my body on optimal diet would actually be like. So I started with one meal a day, then um, not eating just one meal a day, but just replacing one meal a day, still having reasonably normal breakfast and having my normal vegetable stir fries for, for lunch. 
And uh, then in the next week, I um, changed another meal over. I switched over breakfast and then I still had my normal lunches. And then over time, I started eliminating a little bit more and more plant foods and then only kept very few in my diets. And then um, just switched over to eggs, ground beef, uh, salmon, sardines, lamb. Uh, I got a slow cooker and I was cooking gigantic slabs of meat for, for the entire week. And um, I noticed, apart from my digestion improving pretty much uh, immediately, that I also found changes in my fingernails, my skin, uh, my hair that I hadn't really noticed before. Then after a few weeks, I realized that because I was still running regularly, that that really niggling persistent Achilles tendon injury that I had on one foot all of a sudden was clearing up. And I know a little bit about rehab and I know a little bit about how to address things like that. And it was one of the things I was never able to get under control. All of a sudden it would get better. And then just weird things uh, started happening where maybe um, a month and a half or two months in when I was driving, I noticed that uh, my eyesight had gotten better. I wear contact lenses and previously every couple of years I would just need a, a stronger prescription. And I noticed that I could uh, read street signs more clearly, license plates more clearly, uh, things like that. Then um, other things like uh, when I was walking up the hill to, to get the bus to go to work, I realized that all of a sudden I could breathe through my nose, which uh, I um, uh, kind of link back to, you know, not really having to chew much previously and already starting to see some changes in my um, in my jaw and also um, maybe having a bit of uh, post-nasal drip that uh, was clearing up as well. None of these things were apparent health issues to me. And I uh, just did not know that I, over the years, had uh, become accustomed to my body functioning suboptimally without really being on the radar of any treatable condition. I have nothing that worried myself and nothing that uh, I thought needed a different solution. So it was a very minimal intervention. Um, I found the foods very enjoyable and very affordable as well. Um, on the diet I was before, I spent a lot of money on supplements, chia seeds, hemp seeds, barley grass, uh, vitamin B12, vitamin D, a lot of things that uh, I needed to um, incorporate with the foods that I, I was eating based on the blood test that I had before. And yeah, all of a sudden, that was not an issue anymore. Cooking took less time. Meal prep was not an issue. I transitioned to um, two meals uh, a day quite quickly, really became passionate about intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating. Um, and that made things a lot easier as well. Um, and um, I noticed that I was not going through those energy uh, ups and downs during the day any longer. Um, at where I had to have breakfast before I left to go to the practice. Then at 9.30, 10 a.m., I had to have a little snack that I made the night before. And then by lunchtime, I was already ravenous and getting a little bit shaky. And I didn't realize that that was happening because it was my normal. It was my default. And all those things improved through changing my diet. And that those were very positive changes that even for a person who, you know, was not trying to address something impressive enough to really dig deep, trying to learn more and see how I could incorporate that clinically with people as well. That's so fantastic. When you started to know the difference, the improvement in your eyesight, how long into carnivore do you think you were? You were just that was probably um, between two and three months, if I remember correctly. And um, that was also when I started experimenting with uh, taking an organ meats into my diet which i've never never had before so i was starting to eat liver i was starting to eat kidney i was starting to eat heart and you know from as far as we know the liver intake uh, can actually do have uh, have that effect on people as well and yeah this was one of the most surprising changes again in somebody who was convinced that he was healthy and didn't have any particular problems that needed addressing yeah it's amazing how we get used to what we think is yeah. just you know normal of course, yeah. of course. I, I heard I went for a run today or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were, what was um what were the skin changes like? Um, I just noticed that um, in, in photos, I looked a little bit dried out um, and uh, that I felt I got a certain more youthful glow back. I usually have a very youthful appearance as it is and never really looked my age. But um, I noticed that um, around my eyes and uh, around my um, my mouth and my lips when, when I was smiling, that my face looked um, 
fuller in a way without looking looking chubby or without looking that um, there was a change in in body weight or body composition or anything like that. And so um, you know when we when we talk about people and we talk about people having a youthful, healthy glow that is difficult to quantify objectively, uh, this is something that I started noticing when I looked in the mirror um, as if I had been out in the in the sun more or as if um, you know I overall things in my life were just going really well. There's definitely a different sense of um, vitality that was showing externally as well as well. Well, that's fantastic. Your skin looks great now. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> what, so does what, yours. Yeah, thank you. Was there, um, so did you, so I know that you said that Achilles um, tendon didn't, wasn't bothering you. Did you notice also different kinds of recovery besides that less, less pain did you know I yeah mean, yeah i um one of my hobbies is climbing it suits my slim tiny body i'm i'm five six i've never been you know a bit big uh, intimidating male or anything like that um and uh i used to climb quite a lot at that time um uh, like i said probably you know between eight and ten hours uh, a week and after a climbing session your yeah, hands would hurt the skin would be very very rough sometimes you uh, overextend a little bit and uh, you know especially shoulder and, and forearms and things like that can be quite sore for a couple of days and i noticed that i did not need as much recovery as i needed before even though like i said i was able quite quickly to cut out my supplements uh, quite immediately and um those were definitely i, I would not say that uh all of a sudden, you know, my climbing grades in, increased or, or anything that is objectively uh, measurable in terms of having higher um, performance. But it felt like I didn't have to work as hard to get the same result anymore. And um, definitely improvements in sleep. I had uh, many more nights where I was sleeping all the way through the night without being woken up. And even if I had a bit of a rough night or something wasn't going well, I was working really late, I could have um, a few days on only four hours or five hours worth of sleep without feeling for the first five, six hours um, of the day that I was still half asleep, that I was still quite foggy and not really able to, to get going. So I did notice that in recovery, I did notice that in sleep quality and being refreshed after sleeping, as well as in being able to get going in the morning straight away when my alarm rang, if I needed uh, an alarm. And overall, the, the thing that people talk about when they when they say brain fog or mental clarity, which again is something that is so non-specific and can be individual for 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 each person, I found that uh, I was on top of my game and my good days uh, in significantly increased for no reason other than the, the change of the the food and the diet that I had. Nice. Did you notice any difference in body composition? I would say so. Um, my body has never changed significantly. Um, I, uh, before I became a practitioner, I had a horrible diet. I was was mainly on you know takeaway and uh, processed foods, and I actually had developed a sugar addiction where I would um, replace entire meals just with blocks of chocolates or gummy bears or something like that, and do that regularly. And it got to the point that. When I was coming home from work, I would go into the closest supermarket and um, in the time from the confectionery aisle to the checkout, um, I would already have eaten half a block of chocolate or have had had a complete candy bar and I would only pay for the empty wrapper. So I, this was really quite uh, unhealthy behavior. So um, You were and, hungry. You were hungry. <laughs> Well, it was not just hunger, though. It was it was definitely medicating emotions. Um, I noticed when I um, did the uh, when I came off the sugar addiction that I was dealing with a lot of loneliness from a relationship breakup that I had, and there was just a lot of things that I didn't want to deal with. But I just thought, you know, it's not changing my body. I can eat whatever I want. Uh, chocolate and treats uh, always celebrated in my family as well. We're all very slim people. Uh, there's not really an issue with obesity or anything like that. So uh, we might have. A metabolism that is suitable for for a high carbohydrate diet as well, um, but I was quite uh, quite miserable as well. So I um, yeah I was not quite uh, aware how um, that was impacting me. And now I got a little bit off track because I forgot the exact precise question that got you me to talk about, about body composition. Body composition. Yeah, so um, with the before and after photos, um, I was not um, overweight. I was not particularly chubby. I had, you know, a reasonably very slim but refined physique, as you would expect for a climber. But um, I definitely noticed that 
I was uh, starting to look more muscular with the same training load um, that some of the like very lower belly fat. And for me, it might have been a quarter of an inch or something like that. Nothing, you know, really like I was very proud of my body the way I was before. And again, I said, yeah, I know I've worked it out. And it's just about you have to do 10 hours of exercise a week. And um, I, I noticed that with the same training load that my body was starting to change. And realistically, I was probably not eating enough or maybe I was not uh, eating enough. You know, it's always the stereotype that you're not eating enough protein on a plant-based diet. Maybe I wasn't for the, the, the output that I had. And again, those were free gains that I, um, why I did not need to pick up another habit um, in my life. I was just changing uh, what I was eating. And uh, I would not say that the, the change in body composition for me was that uh, massive. But even for somebody who's been quite consistent physically, I did uh, notice changes as well. And I think we've got some pictures on that as well. And some people comment, well, you know, to me, it looks the same. The pose is not exactly identical. You know, I'm I'm not a model and I'm not claiming that I had a 100 pound weight loss or anything like that. It's just the effort that I had to put in to get the same or a better result um, had decreased for me. Yeah, we can tell. We can just sort of tell about the way our body feels and it mm. looks in with how we wear clothing or something. There's like little changes yeah. that only that only are only the person in that body maybe can tell sometimes. Maybe yeah. Um, mm. But yeah, but there's like a, a qualitative difference I, I noticed myself. It's like mm. a, something was more solid. That's beautiful. Mm. Yeah. Well then, so so you didn't go in thinking that necessarily it was going to be these great big changes, but you were able. It sounds like you were just. A, doing yourself and lots of other people a favor by really being diligent and paying attention to all the different changes and notice so many more surprisingly more than you thought, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, I, it was, it was, yeah. it was quite sorry to, to interrupt. I was very surprised by that and I did not expect that change. Again, my belief system being that I was healthy and problem free. Uh, I, I had a lot of righteousness and probably an ego build up around that as well and, and not an accurate uh, self image. And um, yeah, it was um, was was quite uh, unexpected. The, the biggest thing that I was so uh, disappointed by and what really melted my brain is that so much of the education that I received as a practitioner, even though I considered myself above average interested in health and above uh, average educated in, in health as well, it's so much information that's out there in terms of what a healthy diet is and what we should be eating is based on the research that's out there, not even factually correct anymore. All the, the things that um, we got indoctrinated into, um, you know, uh, cholesterol causes heart disease and saturated fat should be avoided because it uh, messes with uh, the cholesterol. The the fact that um, it's it's just really, um, we need to use all those, uh, those seeds, oils, and we need to be in a high carbohydrate diet in order to, to be healthy. I believed that and I lived that. And I was so flabbergasted and so uh, disappointed that even me as a practitioner, I can be walking around there in the real world and giving incorrect um, advice uh, to people. And this is the thing that uh, really reignited that passion for learning uh, within myself. I delved, delved deep into um, looking at the the sources, looking at the research, looking at Ansel Keys, looking at the cholesterol hypothesis, and really identifying are all those crazy carnivore and keto and paleo people are they actually onto something? And I realized many of those claims of those what I would consider alternative crazy communities are absolutely warranted and backed up by science and that there are definitely other interests at play to keep people locked in a paradigm that requires us to over and over again purchase processed foods by certain companies that get to, uh, even particularly engineered to make them you know as enjoyable and as addictive as possible and um, to then get slotted into uh, a medical system where it's a self-perpetuating problem with heart disease and diabetes being some of the most prevalent diseases of, of, of modern times and uh, things that can really be avoided through behaviors and it's not that people have to exercise 20 hours a week this is what 
uh, again, which, which completely shifted my perspective in terms of um, what I can recommend to, uh, to patients and really all of a sudden give people actionable steps, you know, see if, what happens if you change one meal a day, see what happens uh, if you incorporate saturated fat in your diet, see what happens if you eat a couple of eggs and a piece of fish in the morning and see what happens to your migraines and lots of other different things that um, where I was just really... Yeah, so disappointed in in myself and the the medical system and the educational system, um, how we are disadvantaging people by not giving them access to um, the whole story. Yeah, it's amazing, and it, and it continues. The beat goes mm. off. It continues, and mm. now you can now you look at it sort of like and watch and witness the the I don't know should we call it lies propaganda I don't know what we could call it, but it continues yeah. on, and in. Yeah. One can find all the science behind the reality, the truth, but you really have to kind of dig and push past yeah. the propaganda yeah. that's really pushed. Yeah, I guess as a, as a consumer, it's very difficult to differentiate between what is propaganda and what uh, you know is what is research and what's credible research. And um, you know, I, I was educated in a paradigm where I know how to read a research paper and I can look at sources. And I again was under the impression I understand things, but just the the sheer volume of uh, evidence and conflicting evidence is very confusing for um, end users. And especially because so many things have become common sense that we now know are factually incorrect. But, you know, that if you want to lose weight, you just have to restrict your calories and uh, you, you, can, you just have to exercise and, you know, cut out the saturated fat. And we all know that's clogging up the arteries and that meat gives you cancer. And all those uh, claims that every child now knows to be correct actually at the very least have uh, a completely opposite side to them or are um, flat out uh, propaganda and things that um, were in, um, institutionalized in order to support a certain agenda. Yeah, whole industries are based on some erroneous claim. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Or even the idea and the claim and the belief that, that vegetables were not only good for us but they were virtuous and the more the better yeah exactly and that um i completely bought the story i completely bought the easy to explain uh paradigm oh it's just, you know it's yeah it's clear we can see the arteries are clogging up and it must be coming from the food and if you don't do that you can see the research and all those plant-based people they live longer and there is you know you can criticize epidemiology and saying that this is all uh, you know just by um, association and not by causation but a lot of things lead back to um, what's called the healthy user bias as well that people who are more interested in looking after themselves and living longer they are more likely to undertake what uh, is considered to be healthy behaviors and they would are less likely to have what's considered unhealthy behaviors you know those people would um, prepare their own food uh, those people would uh, control portion sizes uh, they would uh, carefully plan the diet they often would have uh, higher quality food they would live a lifestyle that's uh, more conducive to stress management or reducing stress as opposed to getting stuck uh, in a rut and really overloading their, their body with uh, things that it can't handle long term and all those those are the people that then look at what's promoted and say, oh, you know, you got to be vegetarian or vegan or at least whole food plant-based. And that's where those numbers are coming from. And it's very, again, um, very challenging to have an objective discussion about that because in the scientific community, if you're going against the grain, you're easily um, lumped into with uh, the crazy people that get the information just from Facebook. And um, it's, uh, it's quite challenging. To, yeah, it's challenging to establish a, a, a position that is grounded in, in reality. And I was very fascinated to find how passionate people get about diet and nutrition um, as well. I had my um, experiences with uh, vegetarianism and uh, whole food plant-based diet. I never called myself vegan, but I was very interested in the ideology and the ethics behind that as well. I believe that, you know, ultimately we do want to do things for the planet that makes sure that, you know, we things are sustainable. And there's so much dogma um, around that, uh, again, that I'm just finding out now that a lot of the claims that are being made on either end of the, the spectrum, you know, that cow farts are uh, destroying the atmosphere, that that's not uh, necessarily a truth. And that, you know, if we just get rid of all the ruminants and all the factory farming, we can just grow crops uh, everywhere instead, which is not entirely true. And the dependence oh, I mean, on so fossil... There were used to be so yeah, small uh, ruminants. Yeah. 
and then the dependence on uh, fossil fuels and i didn't realize that in order to grow the the fruit and the vegetables that we're growing we need um, the uh, petroleum fertilizers or the fossil fuel derived fertilizers which is producing uh, exponentially more methane than the, the the ruminants just in the fertilizer production i didn't realize we had to destroy entire ecosystems in order to do monocrop agriculture i didn't know we needed to till the soil which basically renders it uh, lifeless and uh, completely deprives it of its capacity to um, uh, to hold water and uh, contributes to the desertification and the uh, uh, climate changes. I was really convinced that by making that choice of eating less meat, I was uh, contributing to the um, environment. And that's a very difficult uh, and nuanced discussion, but um, depends on how uh, you carry yourself and what your uh, consumer behaviors are um, as a vegan and what your behaviors are as an omnivore, as a, as a meat eater. One is not necessarily more environmentally friendly than the other. And more does one does not necessarily contribute to fewer or more animal deaths than the other. I didn't realize the whole topic about crop protection that uh, animals actively are seeking out the vegetables that were uh, that were planting and it's not that all those little mice die during harvest that rodents have to be trapped and killed and poisoned and that goes into the food chain and all the wild pigs and the deer and the birds they all have to constantly be shot to um, protect the crops and that the pesticides obviously uh, and insecticides and fungicides dramatically uh, contribute to um, the decline of entire ecosystems yeah. while i was you know really believing that uh, that paradigm you know there's no blood on my plate so nothing had to die for me to be able to eat these beans and the spinach so it was very uneducated as a consumer i was uneducated as a meat eater as well i did um interestingly enough uh, end up watching a few of those vegan documentaries as well uh, dominion is a very interesting one that uh, looks into um the factory farming practices and that dramatically um, educated me as a consumer. Okay, you know, even if I'm buying meat, um, I have to know where my food is coming from. Just like as a vegan, I also have to make sure where I know where my food is coming from and that there's not tropical fruit being flown to, to my supermarket from the other end of the world, which doesn't make any environmental sense. But as a meat eater as well, it helped me to make uh, clearer choices to be more connected to my position in the in the food chain and my um, power as a consumer in the distribution network as well that I can literally make choices uh, that impact uh, animal welfare and uh, the ecology of my immediate environment as well. Yeah, just a food change, way of eating change, just opened a whole nother universe. It's, it's such a rabbit hole. You really, as you enter the carnivores, because you there's everything changes how you yeah. view medicine, how you view your health, how you view eating, how you view uh, t taking care of animals, how you view farming, how you view the soil. And j it just goes on and on. So I think it's really great that you have been um, uh, so um, actively, you know, wanting to find out the information and uncovering more and more information. And then you get to share that with your, in your practice. With your yeah, thank you, and I, and I have uh, you know countless anecdotes of of people that um, I have never really been able to look after as a practitioner because I felt it was outside of my uh, you know my my area, not of expertise because we do advise on, on diet and lifestyle, but outside of my skill set to. Um, facilitate behavioral change and i have a lot of people who do um, struggle with weight and uh, you know some frustrating stories of, of people really really putting the effort in because as a practitioner the stereotype is all oh, fat people are lazy they're not trying um they are lying as well because there's no way that they can actually be eating the things that they're telling me they're eating and still you know have the body that they have and um, i um, was probably very very judgmental and and very uneducated on on that as well and i have um, stories of people who um completely changed the diet you know basically just on on salads and a lot of uh, raw foods um, then getting a personal trainer specifically for weight loss and within a month or six weeks actually having gained weight despite all the the efforts that they were putting in and you just you just have to imagine how 
humiliating that is for a person if you are really doing everything exactly as instructed and first of all you're putting all that effort and that work in and you're not getting the results then people accuse you of being lazy and and not trying and then they give up on you and i i can just only imagine how crushing that is for an individual and now seeing people who their entire lives have really been trying to do the right things and all of a sudden there's a whole nother world opening up for them that is immediately improving their health and well-being giving them the empowerment and the agency back and also is giving them the uh, results and the self-confidence that comes with that and the health benefits that comes with that it's a very very um, beautiful thing and that humbled me tremendously again to realize how little I know and how willing I, I need to be to, to continuously educate myself as well. And previously, you know, I was spending three, four hours a week on shopping and food and supplements and I had to plan my meals and every meal was freshly cooked and all those things that those were not things that I could easily, you know, if, if somebody's got a family and a job and other things to worry about, it's very, very hard to make changes like that in an adult life. So I felt I could not do the right things to um, uh, allow people to change that behavior. And now, you know, getting people on, hey, as opposed to having your oatmeal in the morning, how about you try having a couple of eggs and a bit of uh, ground beef or a piece of fish or something like that and just do that for a week and, you know, do or do one day a week and see how you feel instead. And then people immediately, you know, getting getting that permission back and getting that education back that, OK, by doing that, I'm actually not destroying my health, but I'm actually doing something that's good for me. And then them redeveloping that immediate connection to their body is very, very gratifying. I'm very, yeah, I feel very, very blessed and very inspired again that um, I get another opportunity to expand the, the tool set in terms of uh, giving people the power back and giving people the health back. That's fantastic. I'm so glad that you that you decided to uh, have your direct experience and had, and was able to see all the wonderful benefits and then share it with your patients, your clients. That's really great. I'm really glad. Mm -hmm. um, so let me just pick your brain a little bit sure. for the people who 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 like to know well, what exactly does he eat. Um, I think it's pretty clear sort of what you eat, but, um, but just, but just sort of give an example of like, so are you eating twice a day and when do you eat that first meal? Yeah. So, um, at the moment, um, I, uh, I'm on a predominantly animal foods, uh, diet up until a couple of weeks ago. Um, I still, um, had at least one meal a day included uh, kale and, and broccoli or leafy greens or something like that that I would prepare I would steam them for very long to you know break down that what we believe now is other the anti-nutrients in there and disarm the lectins and, and things like that but um, had really reduced uh, portion sizes with that um, and I was on I would say probably an 80 20 diet 80 percent all fat and, and animal foods and the other 20% uh, some kind of carbohydrate uh, containing uh, vegetables. I'd already cut out uh, processed foods. I'd already cut out sugar. So they were, you know, I had done that for years. There was no desserts. There was nothing else. And right now what I'm eating is um, uh, breakfast is usually uh, two to four eggs, depending on how hungry I am. And um, I make that in butter or in ghee. Um, and I have that with ground beef or with salmon or with sardines. And I do have, um, as a side, I have um, sauerkraut or kimchi, depending on what I feel like. Uh, the, the fermented vegetables still, um, I find, work very well for me. I do have avocado because I enjoy it, not because, you know, I think it's a health food, but um, they're very available and they're local here as well. So it's easy for me to incorporate that. And then I have a couple of uh, spoonfuls of uh, sheep yogurt as well, which I personally prefer to, uh, to cow's yogurt um, and sometimes I have a bit of uh, cheese as well and I have predominantly sheep cheese as well which again seems to agree with me uh, better I um, have organ meats regularly so if I do have the ground beef for breakfast I do blend liver into that uh, as well once a week I have a meal that's exclusively organ meats which is uh, lamb heart lamb kidney 
and beef liver and i portioned that up um for um my last meal in the day um i usually slow cook uh, muscle meat so that's either chuck or brisket i buy cheaper cuts and i cook them until they're they're tender um i make bone broth as well and in just have those as the regular staples of my diet i have uh, got a good arrangement with my local butcher and he saves beef fat trimmings for me so once a week i get a big bag of a couple of pounds pounds of actual grass-fed beef fat and i fry that up in butter or in ghee and i have that just with the meals with the breakfast or with the with the dinner and um so a huge chunk of my diet is uh fat-based because this is my fuel source now as well. I have um, the option that I've given myself because one of my favorite foods previously was pizza and I still really enjoy pizza. And I like eating bad pizza, like the supermarket frozen foods section pizza. And I've got, I gave myself the option to have that once a week. And if I eat it, I really sincerely enjoy it. I put extra meat uh, on on the pizza that I that I eat. I put uh, sometimes some of the um, bone broth leftover meat on there in addition as well. Um, but you know, I'm under no illusion that that's a, that's a healthy food. But I feel like I want to be on a diet that's sustainable, where I don't feel like I've got any cheat meals. And I have gotten. I think uh, four weeks or six weeks without having my weekly pizza and I didn't feel like I was, you know, punishing myself or sacrificing anything, but this is still something I incorporate. But um, the main nutrition really coming from the muscle meat, I found that if I um, don't have the organ meats in my diet, I had to increase the quantity of muscle meat to um, a point where I would be uncomfortably full as opposed to be satiated and still feel like I would be hungry. So I would eat a pound sometimes almost two pounds of muscle meat for dinner um, at the end when I wasn't eating any organ meats. And I could not uh, get that feeling of uh, I'm actually doing the right thing for my body anymore. So for me, the organ meats, absolute game changer and a fundamental core component of my diet this is why I have a little bit of liver every day in the heart and the kidney on a weekly basis. Um, dairy, I was never that crazy about. Um, we do have options here to get single herd milk or raw milk as well and to get all kinds of different cheeses and other things, but it's, it's never really been a, a big uh, thing for me. Um, and so this is where uh, yeah the majority of my intake comes from. A lot of pure saturated grass-fed beef fat, uh, butter, ghee, and uh, then a little bit of muscle meat, a lot of uh, organ meat um, and eggs. Uh, fish is uh, not very affordable compared to the lamb and the, the beef that we have here. And this is why I don't have a lot of fish, uh, but I enjoy eating that very much as well. Fermented vegetables, sauerkraut, kimchi, um, and depending on how I feel like it, I do incorporate you know, some steamed greens into my diet because I want to maintain that metabolic flexibility. I think that's a very, very good goal to have. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that what works for me. And it took a while to tweak that. And I don't think there's one prescription that fits everybody. But those are the things that I've worked out over the last year that uh, make life very, very easy for me. That sounds fantastic, Robin. That sounds perfect, actually. <laughs> um, do you drink coffee? It's cheaper. it's cheaper than uh, what yes, I was yes. spending on food before yes. as well. It's totally um, cheaper. I think so too. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, on any diet, you can uh, be on, on extremes. You know, you can do a dollar a day vegan diet and eat beans and rice. And, you know, you can survive on that a very long time as well. And you can be on the supplemented whole food, organic vegan diet that I was on before. Where I was would spend, you know, a couple of hundred dollars a, a week on food. And on a meat-based diet, it's also very easy to be on both ends of the um, of the spectrum. Sorry, I'm just going to restart my camera here. On a meat-based diet, it's also um, very easy to be on um, extreme ends of the, the spectrum where I, I could spend yeah. hundreds of dollars on the right. premium cuts. Ribeyes, of, you can be ribeyes all day long, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And uh, but this is why I found the nutritional value and the cheaper cuts is just as high. And they are often even ironically, the fattier cuts as well, which for me and for my body works so much better. Um, and uh, in terms of Australian dollars, um, $10 a day is very, very achievable. $9 a day, $8 a day. Once you get below $8 a day, you know, those are not happy chickens and happy cows anymore, but it's very, uh, very doable. So in US dollars, that's what 10 Australian dollars is maybe eight or seven um, US dollars. And, and so um, you can, 
you can eat really well and um, in a way that I would consider to be health insurance for a lot of people as well on a very affordable budget as well. I never had the feeling that there was not enough variety in the food. There's so many different ways to um, prepare things and so many different ways to uh, switch it up um, as well that um, I did not get bored uh, that easily. Same on a plant-based diet. There's so many options available there as well. And uh, yeah, it was um, it, it was definitely very... It's, it's very possible to not only make that survivable and affordable, but uh, to give your body what it needs to live a very long, healthy life. When you're helping your clients, um, do you give them a meal plan or do you just help them with recipes or maybe help them explain how to cook some organ meats? That yeah, kind of thing? yeah. Um, I found that um, there, there is not a one-size-fits-all approach and that for a lot of people, I really try to find what is the smallest, most achievable steps. And then when people see, oh, okay, you know, I only have to do this one little thing um, that is uh, in many cases already giving them quick wins. Uh, you know, teenagers respond to that so quickly as well, but, you know, full-grown adults do uh, quickly as well as soon as the body comes back online. Um, and I do not put people on restricted diets. I emphasize education and really telling people, hey, you know, um, insulin and carbohydrates is a thing if insulin is going around in, in your system and it just, uh, you know, as it's uncontrolled, then a certain other processes in your body are impacted by that. And we have to talk about lipogenesis and what makes your body produce fat cells as opposed to allowing your body to tap into the energy of the body for your lifestyle. What might be the appropriate fuel source? Is it appropriate for you to get your energy from carbohydrates? Does it work for you? Would it make more sense in your situation to switch over to become fat adapted? And then depends on what people's goals are. I do not work specifically on weight loss. Like I said, my special interest is more in idiopathic conditions and autoimmune diseases that do not have a very good plan of, of treatment in the biomedical paradigm. Uh, paradigm. Um, and um, so what I do with people, I, it, uh, I recommend animal-based diets more often than plant-based diets, but I do have patients that are vegetarian or vegan for different reasons, and I'm not trying to convince them otherwise if uh, it's just something that's fundamentally important for them. But I do try to, if I know what they're doing is actively interfering with the health goals or lifestyle goals that they have, I have to tell them, you know, there's no other way than to, to give people that reality check but um i do not believe that um there's one uh diet that every human should be on there's certain principles that if we follow them um, based on your genetics based on your state of metabolic health based on your your pathways based on if you've got other autoimmune diseases or other things based on your insulin sensitivity everybody has a separate fat threshold everybody has a, a separate carbohydrate threshold and uh, gut microbiome composition and genetics and you know and history it does not necessarily yeah. make sense to put somebody who's got i would say mediterranean genes to put them on a southeast asian diet because i think that that's healthier for for them you know we do have to honor the reality everyone, of everyone has a different history of of how they have arrived yeah and what kind yeah, of and I, I believe they, that... they've inflicted upon themselves that maybe exactly they have to... exactly yeah. and um i i believe that we do need to uh, to honor that and if somebody else looks great on instagram and a person that we idolize it's very easy to Mm -hmm. um, adapt that belief system. Hey, if I just do exactly what this person does, then it's going to work for me. And this is why that the social media food community is such a trap because every diet works for certain people under certain circumstances. The same person might operate better on a different diet under different circumstances. If your lifestyle changes, if your output changes, if your metabolic demands change, um, you know, I'm happy to switch to what's necessary. I'm not evangelical about the whole world should be carnivore or the whole world should be vegan. And I do not want uh, my patients to only have one option. I do not think that this is right. And people really um, build up that uh, righteousness and that belief system around, hey, you know, it's worked just th th exactly the way I was. I build up that righteousness and that ego around, look at me, it works for me, look at me, I'm healthy, look at what I'm doing. If you do the same thing, then the same thing is going to happen for you. And this is disingenuous. It just does not work that way. And if uh, we can honor that, I think a lot of the, um, you know, ethical debates that we have about uh, food choices can be a lot more productive and amicable as well and you know lead to 
people being healthier overall as opposed to bickering and, and criticizing that oh, you know you should be doing what i'm doing well direct experience is key and you've proven that with your own direct experience and how mm. it opened up a whole mm. new way of thinking mm. for you about food. It, it, I, even though i did it uh, slowly and uh, the, the vast majority of my experiences were positive there are certain animal foods that don't work for me you know a lot of people really like cooking with tallow or with lard or bacon leftover bacon grease or, or something like that and if i have that even a little bit in my diet i get really really bad reflux from it and i've researched it and i still can't quite work it out and i've narrowed it down to that particular thing if i eat it you know like clockwork i can't fall asleep because i feel like i have to throw up and i actually almost get a headache and i never get headaches because something is not uh, aligning with with my body okay i had to I mean, that's accept that fat. that's not a ruminant fat so that really is a different that composition yeah yeah and you know there's different uh, different reasons for that but you know if i just follow the generic uh, carnivore advice you know not all of that is is working for me either and um i even though i had already eradicated sugar out of my life which um you know i, I don't think is a very common thing to, to do with people i didn't realize that my fuel source was still carbohydrates through the vegetables that i was eating and when i um was not eating any anymore after i uh, switched i had to go to that fat adaptation phase as well. And in that stage, I was still training. I was still running. I was doing pull-ups for climbing training. And I had probably a period of um, between one and three weeks where it got uh, really, really dire. And I felt when I was running, every step was just so difficult and my legs were so heavy. And I felt every step, I wasn't going to be able to take another step after that. And I would fall off the pull-up bar after three pull-ups because my body had not learned yet to do that yeah. new, uh, gluconeogenesis. And yeah, that, that, that was the fat adaption adaptation exactly. for you. Yeah, yeah yeah absolutely and um had i not experienced that myself and had i not uh, been educated about that i would have said oh my god you know that's all the cholesterol clogging up my circulatory <laughs> system and uh, straight away i have to go back to my plant-based diet and i'm sure i would have quote unquote felt better to uh, just keep eating my vegetables at that point but um, as soon as my body was able to repair the metabolism and to switch over to um to the fat adaptation and for me to learn more about electrolytes and to realize oh my god i had accidentally because i was not seasoning my food uh, not even using salt i had accidentally completed completely eliminated all sodium from my diet as well i didn't know about potassium i didn't know about magnesium and any of the other uh, electrolytes um that now especially with the organ meats uh, i can uh, compose that uh, in a way that works for my body where i feel i've got just as much uh, strength that I that I had before, but I needed to uh, to learn that. And then other things, uh, you know, uh, some ways of preparing the the bone broth seem to work better than others. And uh, some animal foods again uh, seem to agree with overall my sense of well being better than others. And then I learned about the animal feed impacting the omega three to omega six ratios in, in uh, food as well. So a lot of pork um, is kind of off the off the table for me for uh, for that reason and so you know you just learn more and more about it and um if something doesn't work um it might just that it's a lack of education i've only been doing this for one year diet is something that uh, continually changes as our body changes as we're going through life as well and so it is uh, i think very very fair that no matter on which diet uh, you're on you can develop that palate fatigue and you need to switch things up um, at a certain time but apart from that i i never had those stereotypical like carnivore you know digestive system problems i was very surprised that immediately as soon as i reduced the fiber intake in my diet um i didn't know what perfect digestion felt like and, and looked like it's, it's just a complete 180 degree from you know what i thought no, was normal. It, that was one of the, the most amazing first things was like oh well that was nothing i feel nothing yeah. i feel yeah. i feel nothing yeah. i just yeah. had a big steak and, and i feel nothing yeah exactly and um for me they're not um really feeling particular withdrawal symptoms that's i think a bit of a unique thing that i was uh you know already off the of the sugar and and not that dependent on you know direct uh, carbohydrates you asked me about uh, coffee as well i i'm a weird person i've always really liked water it kind of suits my personality it's very bland and you know very very basic i guess and um so I, i've never been big on on coffee or tea or caffeine or anything else in general so there was no withdrawal for me um, in that regard 
Um, I didn't have the sugar withdrawal. And other than the fat adaptation, um, because I did the transition very methodical and I didn't just, you know, from one night to the other, 1st of January, I'm going to be carnivore. It was very possible for my gut microbiome and for my metabolism to start switching over as well. And this is what I would recommend to, to people um, because, uh, you know, if you're changing so many variables at once, you're likely to blame the change in diet because it's, you know, if you're not getting results, it might be because it's too aggressive, not uh, because it fundamentally doesn't work for you. So that's, you know, the the coffee story. And uh, like I said, it um, there were some things that I just had to work out. But uh, overall, um, if I have it available, um, I think uh, for the lifestyle that I have, the level of activity that I have, the job that I'm doing, uh, fat-adapted, animal-based diet is what um, works for me. And it seems to be evident in my uh, immediate genetical history as well that you know this is what's been good for us and this is what's good for me at this point. Excellent. That's excellent. <laughs> I think you've said it all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, thank you for pulling out that information and for giving me an opportunity to to share that. And uh, I hope that uh, it at least makes people curious. I really encourage people to question uh, what they hear about um, extreme diets. And, you know, um, I, I hope to be able to give people at least uh, something to think about and education and information that they can evaluate uh, in their own time so they can make the decision that's right for them. Excellent. Direct experience is key. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brooke. All right. Love to talk to you. Carry on. Carney on. <laughs> <laughs>